going to be looking at today is the rise of the far right, and in particular why it's discussed through the prism of the past, so why the 1930s is tripping off everybody's lips and they try and understand what's happening now in 2018. My name is Tiffany Jenkins, I'm chairing this lovely panel. I'll introduce them, they'll speak for a few minutes each, we'll have a conversation up here and then throw it open to you for your points and for your questions. So speaking first, um, the best dressed of the panel, I believe, is Paul Lay. He's the editor of History Today and he's a fellow at the Royal Historical Society and the Humanities Research Institute at the University of Buckingham. Speaking after Paul and his immediate right is Razi Ginsberg, he's the director of the Anne Rand Society. We'll then hear from Vicky Price, the Chief Economic Advisor and Board Member of the Centre for Economics and Business Research, and she's a member of the Economic Advisory Group of the British Chambers of Commerce. And speaking for the my immediate right is Jacob Faradi, who's the Junior Commissioning Editor at the Daily Mail. So Paul, would you like to begin? Yeah. Uh, is this working? Okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, since about 2015, 2016, I've been collecting uh, historical anachronisms and dubious historical analogies, of which there have been many. Uh, and it seems as though this perfect storm of Brexit, um, a dysfunctional, or not, depending on your view, uh, US president, murderous meltdown that's occurred in the Middle East, and uh, the rise of autocrats around the world, has seen commentators scrambling around for often extraordinarily dubious historical parallels. And the more imaginative commentators have compared Trump, for example, uh, to Nero. Some have compared him to Catiline, the Roman senator, uh, who, who conspired to overthrow the Republic. But the go-to default in any argument about Trump is to compare him with Hitler. Uh, it is literally impossible, one young historian said to me, to find any historian who thinks that Trump is not the reincarnation. <laughs> and I said to them, well, you're looking at one here. So why do the 1930s have such resonance when we think about public history and we think about historical marriage? Well, firstly, I'd say it's one of the few historical periods about which people think they know anything about, even if it's half-baked ideas. So if we spot something on the political horizon uh, that is even mildly outside the norm, or what we consider the norm, the 1930s is the default. We don't know much, say, about the end of the 19th century, for example, and the beginning of the 20th. So we don't employ the analogies of a genuine age of populism. And remember, I think it's important to remember that populism is almost always a demand for more democracy rather than less. We miss the parallel debates of 120, 110 years ago about declinism in the West, about the growth of conspiracy theories, think of the Drake as a fair for the, only the most famous one. We don't see the attacks on the elites of the Gilded Age, the huge technological shifts that took place at the end of the 19th and 20th century in transport, in electrification, and energy that mirror the developments in our own age, all these very different ones. But not only do we not recognize the past's similarities, we don't recognize the differences. We are essentially a narcissistic age that is only concerned about ourselves when the discipline of history is always about the others. It's not about us, it's about them. So, a good experiment of thinking historically is not, I think, to look back to, say, the 1930s, which is what we're discussing here, but to look forward from the position of a person in the 1930s and think how similar is their world to ours. Well, they'd be astonished to see just how rich even an audience like this, I presume you're all terribly well healed, but um, they would be astonished by the sheer wealth of the society that we live in now. They would also be struck by how healthy we all are 
extraordinarily diverse in most places, anyway, certainly in London. Women are prominent. And so when we discuss with them ideas about travel, about the places we visited, the places we've been, the frequency of that, and as well as discussing the challenges of technology that we face, we would be literally living in another world. History, in other words, uh, does not re repeat. And if we take this kind of view of history, then we do realise we're in a new world, and we can take more instructive parallels in the past. The 1890s, I've already mentioned. Maybe the 1790s is an important one. If we look at, say, the wretched, vile election that was conducted between Adams and Jefferson, for example, at the point. And that's just in the West. Because if we are not to be confined to the 1930s, like some grim historical Sisyphus, we need to embrace history in much wider forms and deeper forms. We need to embrace its chronological depth and geographical breadth. The rest of the world, after all, has turned up to the party, whether we like it or not. And we have to understand that world. We can no longer just be concerned about the West in the 1930s. And there's one further point I'd make about the Hitler 1930s analogy. When you compare someone with Hitler, you place them beyond the pale. They are outside polite discourse. No one, quite rightly, will speak up for Hitler. And so it's, in a sense, the historical equivalent of blocked reporting. And though I'd like to see greater variety of debate, I think it's a wish that's unlikely to be granted in the current uh, FIBA atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, when I was looking up what passes for far right uh, in preparation for this panel, I, I came across a color-coded map of uh, the rise of the new European right from the Telegraph from 2014. Uh, and the right-wing movements on the rise across Europe were divided into three categories. Populist right, far right, and extreme far right. So just the words far just the word far or just the word extreme, which I think are interchangeable in this context, are no longer enough on their own. Um, and when I looked at the parties uh, listed, um, I pose, you know, in some cases, most of what they say, in other cases, all of what they say. Uh, I also disagree with the lumping together, for example, of, of UKIP and Golden Dawn. Um, they weren't in the same category, but they were both included in this new right that we need to look out for. Uh, this seems unnecessarily hysterical, and this is in the Telegraph. So you can only imagine, you know, if this was The Guardian, then uh, the categories would be worse than Hitler, worse than worse than Hitler, and OMG is so much worse than Hitler. <laughs> um, and this misuse of language is a major problem. Like so many terms used in political discourse today, uh, the term far-right has no clear definition and it's used more as a smear than a term that identifies a clearly defined specific group or a range of ideas that belong together under one umbrella term. Uh, the first problem with this term is what it includes. So anyone from Nazis to people who would like to limit immigration, people who criticize Islam, uh, Wikipedia even includes anti-communists in the far-right spectrum. So, whether you're defined by your support for genocidal totalitarian regimes or by your opposition to them, you can be described as far-right. Uh, the second problem with the term is what it excludes. The further you go to the so-called right and the so-called left of the political spectrum, the more similarities you encounter on both ends in terms of fundamental views of human nature and the role of the state. Uh, advocates of identity politics, both left and right, want individuals to be judged based on aspects of their identity that are predetermined, rather than on their self-made character. Both sides believe that the individual ultimately belongs to the group and want the government to be structured in a way that reflects that. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that uh, we should categorize socialists as far right. 
I am saying that the whole term as it is commonly used has no meaning. Uh, the entire right-left political spectrum, as it refers to current politics, is more confusing than clarifying, uh, and that's the opposite of what language is for. A proper political spectrum is possible, but such a spectrum should refer to political ideologies, not to the ever-changing, unprincipled tribalism of the contemporary left-right divide. Uh, such a spectrum would have fundamentally opposing views on opposite sides. And on such a spectrum, if we're going to put socialists on one side, say the left, we should put all socialists on that side, including national socialists. Uh, the essential similarity between the so-called far right and the so-called far left is their collectivism. And the essential distinction that should be made when identifying the spectrum of political ideologies is collectivism versus individualism. Pro-white and anti-white identitarianism are not different in any fundamental way any more than nationalism and socialism or feminism and men. Uh, all, of, all of the above agree that the group rather than the individual is what matters, and all of the above in their current manifestations claim victim status. Uh, the consensus is that the individual has no control over his life, and the arguments between these groups are over how big government should save us from ourselves and which group should be prioritized in that process. Uh, so are certain aspects of the current political climate reminiscent of 1930s Germany? In a sense, yes, but uh, it's a fragmented, if you will, intersectional version of 1930s Germany, where groups bizarrely demand special treatment not because of their supposed superiority, but because of their supposed inferiority. Uh, and that's still really scary, but hopefully this intersectionality would lead identity politics to defeat itself before we get to the modern version of late 1930s Germany. Explosion of the financial sector uh, from 2008 um, onwards, uh, we've been worrying about whether we're going back to possibly having a great depression like we had then. So I think there is an economic aspect to it, uh, the concern that perhaps the authorities had lost control in a way, that regulation had gone crazy and had allowed actually uh, quite a lot of things to happen that shouldn't have happened. Um, and then, of course, what it means in terms of nations fighting with each other. We must forget, of course, that one of the reasons why we had the, uh, the Second World War is because uh, Germany was rather badly punished in 19, after the 1914 war. Um, but also what has happened is that the monetary authorities just didn't work together at all. That lesson has been learned, so, so one of the things we need to worry less about is, is going back to that type of economic concern and of course hyperinflation that we saw in places like Germany and so on. Um, and then of course the rise of populism that came as a result. What happened with that round is that monetary authorities got together, they all lowered interest rates very significantly, they all put loads and loads of money into the system, a bit late you might say, but at least what they did, they, they actually reversed quite a lot of the liquidity crisis that was happening at the time. Uh, quantitative easing that I'm sure most of you have heard about, which is buying corporate bonds in the secondary market and government bonds particularly in the secondary market and a lot of extra liquidity, subsidized loans to businesses, just to keep things afloat. So we had a great recession rather than a great depression. And yet, what you've seen is that there have been these movements, uh, this move of, of the right populist, if you like, that we now worry about in a number of countries like Hungary and elsewhere, and you've seen what's been going on in France until Macron was elected, and so on. Uh, and you begin to wonder why. And that is because I think, uh, the, certainly the authorities had miscalculated in a way uh, the reaction of people who suddenly were faced with the possibility of losing jobs and huge austerity that took place in a number of countries, despite the fact it wasn't as bad as it was back in the Great Depression. And they, they had just not taken account of the fact that a large chunk of the population was not doing particularly well. So we had decades of no growth in real incomes in places like the US was supposed to be doing so well. Uh, we've had this general problem that instead of the share of labor increasing in the economy, it's actually been decreasing in the economy and profits have been rising instead. We've got inequality, of course, uh, that took place. 
And he therefore had a number of, of parties that took advantage of that. Uh, and everyone's trying to talk, of course, about the far right and the far, far right and the far, far right, as we've just been hearing, uh, as being the result of this. Uh, but first of all, the phenomenon is not new. Uh, and the second thing, of course, just as Raz was saying, you have to distinguish between different groupings. Uh, Golden Dawn, as he mentioned, is a terrorist organization, at least it has been uh, defined as such or classified as such. It doesn't really compare with some of the other uh, right wing um, bodies that exist. But also, I think it is worth remembering that, uh, again, as Raz was suggesting, that it can be populist on the right and on the left. And I think it is worth just uh, uh, reminding ourselves that the most successful populist, actually, uh, since 1945 have been the French and Italian communist parties and they were obtaining 30% of the votes in elections on the basis of anti-elitist, just the kind of stuff we heard on Brexit, protectionist appeals, Trump, uh, it's very similar to today's uh, populists and, and in fact as late as uh, 1990 the French communist leader George Marchais uh, was arguing of closing borders, uh, he was ranting on television about well, that's what France should do, shut its borders to European workers, just the type of thing uh, that we have been uh, hearing uh, here uh, as, as well. I mean, the, the truth therefore is that, that Europe's sort of the liberal populists have very little in common uh, with, with the ones that have been necessarily denunciating uh, the, the, the Brussels uh, quite, quite obviously. So you have Victor Orban, uh, very, very different to Salvini. Uh, they have some things in common, they're both in favour of Vladimir Putin, Putin for some reason. Um, whereas Poland's uh, Kaczynski despises Putin. So you have actually quite a lot of differences, even if you look at the more sort of right wing ones. And then Salvini, of course, wants Northern Europe uh, to, to um, uh, actually um, uh, take in more refugees. Uh, but he's actually having uh, a bit of a problem because the Austrians say no way to say. So, so it's not really happening. Uh, so you have those trends, but what is really fundamentally going on? It's not so much those big players and those big parties. And what we see is that there are a number of sort of smaller parties from across the political spectrum, left and right, uh, and they're actually bringing in uh, a decline in, in, in the importance and size of some of the three big groups that exist in, in Europe, for example, the centre-right European People's Party, the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, and then of course the Liberal Centrist Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. So those were the, the main parties. Now what you've got is you have all these little parties that are coming in uh, to, to challenge actually quite a lot of what's going on. So in addition to the well-established right of the, the rise of the rights, which is what we discussed today, there are new political formations which, which reflect much more a sort of social uh, identification um, sort of civil society politics, ecological issues. Uh, so Poland, for example, is several mayors opposed to Kaczynski. Uh, and, uh, and we got, of course, terribly excited about what's going on in Sweden uh, when um, the rise of the Swedish Democrats, don't be confused by the name, uh, quite right wing, in fact, uh, in the recent elections, they, they, what was going on underneath that is the equal rise, and quite significant one, of the left wing vendors party. So, so we see movements of that sort uh, on both sides uh, where, so you can have populist left wing, I mean after all, uh, Tsipras in Greece was a populist left wing leader, uh, actually applying incredibly right wing policies uh, on the country, and then you're seeing that um, at the same time as some of the right wing parties are increasing their share, you've also got quite a lot of left wing parties out there doing better. So my view therefore is that uh, there are all sorts of reasons why more extreme uh, populist parties are arising, uh, but they are counterbalanced by others. Um, and the reason, of course, uh, before the rise has had, had a lot to do with economics, uh, but it isn't one of the areas that should worry us hugely in terms of uh, forcing us to go back to the 1930s. We need to look at both the right and left and their rise and realise that actually, interesting enough, there's much more of a balance out there right now than was the case before the financial crisis. Thank you. Thanks. I think when we're talking about the rise of the far right, we've really got to take the word rise with a pinch of salt. Um, I'm very sceptical that the far right is on the march at the moment. You have to look at events that happened in the States over summer where there's supposed to be this Unite the Right Part 2 rally where all counter-protesters turned up only to find about 20 far-right people in the streets. 
I think really shows that in fact there's more kind of anti far right people than really there is kind of far right people. Over in France, the Front National have had to rename themselves the National Rally because of their previous associations with the far right and realised it wasn't resonating with voters. Um, Pegida, who remembers Pegida in Germany, that other far right institution which in 2015 took 20,000 people to the streets? Um, in 2015, after that rally, they decided to set up a political party called the Liberal Direct Democratic People's Party. I'm sure you've all heard of it. On Facebook last week, it had 300 likes on their Facebook page. It's, I mean, this, this idea of the far right is a real myth. But even if there was a far right that was starting to take control, it'd be highly inaccurate and unhelpful to make these allusions to the 1930s and to Hitler. You only have to look about who we're talking about these days. So here in the UK, we're often told that Tommy Robinson is Hitler part two. Tommy Robinson, the man who was in prison this year um, for contempt of court for 13 months. Look back to 1923, as um, Paul was alluding to. I mean, there, Hitler with his armed black shirts tried to take over Munich and tried to overthrow the government. When Hitler was in prison, he wrote the 600-page book, Mein Kampf, as far as, as, as far as I'm aware. Tommy Robinson hasn't written such a treatise or even tried to. Over in the States, Trump has been called a fascist and a Nazi. He's even called a Nazi by um, a former head of the CIA. And this was due to his um, immigration policy of splitting up migrant kids at the border, something that Obama did, incidentally. And I think it's here that we really see how demeaning it is to make these comparisons to the 1930s. Because what we have here, what Trump was doing over the summer, was separating out illegal migrants. It's, it seems ridiculous that I even have to spell this out, but in the 1930s and the 1940s, Hitler was splitting up kids from their families and putting them in gas chambers. The fact that this needs to be said today, um, pertaining to the discussion of the far right, seems completely nonsensical. And I think these comparisons to the far right in the 1930s and to the Nazis really says more about the kind of people making these kind of comparisons than the people they're talking about. So in January 2017, um, we were told that Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism was Soaring up the book closing, I'm you know, slightly sceptical whether people actually managed to make it to the end um, or not. We were also told that 1984 was flying for the shelves. As far as I'm aware, Mein Kampf stayed pretty low down in the bestseller things. People weren't going away and reading that. It was more people concerned with the alleged rise of the far right. But if there is no rise of the far right, then why aren't people making these allusions to fascism and to Nazism? Now, this is a really important question. Because on a superficial level, it's being used as a way to dismiss ordinary people and ordinary people's ideas. Because if you call someone a fascist or a Nazi, you don't have to go and debate them, do you? They're a fascist or a Nazi. It shows that people aren't taking their ideas. You don't need to try and have the pretense to take these people's ideas seriously. But more seriously, what these allusions really mean is symptomatic of the loss of purpose plaguing the so-called progressive left. Because these people can't comprehend why people voted for Trump. These people can't comprehend why people voted Brexit. They can't comprehend why people might be slightly concerned about immigration or about national sovereignty. But rather, failing to understand why people can't disagree with why people disagree with them, these so-called people making these claims about the rise of the far right and fascism see fascism and Nazism in ordinary people. And this kind of shows why the myth of the far right and the myth of you know 1930, the resurgence of the 1930s and the resurgence of Nazism is a myth. Yes, but it's also a really dangerous myth. Because ultimately, it reveals people making these claims, it reveals their hostility towards the demos itself. Because by dismissing these views as fascist and Nazi, by conjuring up the demons of the 1930s, you're really dismissing these people as beyond redemption, you don't have to deal with them. These are the pesky white boy, let's put them in the cupboard and forget about them, let's you know, put fingers in our ears. These people are disgusting. This was made very clear in the comment that actually Angela Merkel made when she was writing in the um, memorial book at the show of a memorial in Berlin. And she wrote, As you never know whether people are getting more reasonable over time, the German political system must stay the way it is. I mean, here we have it. We have the Chancellor of Germany invoking the Holocaust, invoking all the concentration camps, to warn that perhaps the unreasonable demos might choose something different to what he's putting forward, might choose a different kind of political system, might want a different kind of politics. It was an excuse to constrain the demos, to hold it back, and as a way of reacting against their views. And this is where things get really messy. Because if you try to silence people by invoking Nazism, if you try to silence people by talking about fascism, this political estrangement is only ever going to get worse. 
the audience, um, because we'll have enough time for the panel to reflect a little. I want to get a sense of what people think. Um, can people put their hands up and then we'll pass them the mic? Uh, thanks very much. Um, so, I agree with panelists. I think there's a general consensus that far right is not a very helpful term. Uh, it's being applied today to uh, an analogy that's been made with the 1930s, and quite why that is, I think part of the problem with that actually is that the, the, the amount of the focus there is on Nazi Germany and West in the 1930s in the curriculum, in our education system, it seems to be if you study history at GCSE and then a, choose to do it at A-level, you may end up learning about it three times. And um, so that, that may, and of course there's a huge wealth of depth of history surrounding that as well. The other point I wanted to make is, um, I would argue that actually, if you're talking about sort of what, what we conceptualise as the far right or, or the sort of the extreme right, you might want to consider whether potentially uh, religion, um, so if you take, for example, fundamentalist Islam, um, it could be construed as far right under our conception of the term, in other words, um, hatred, aggression of the non-Muslim other, uh, jihad, the sort of aggressive conquest of uh, non-Muslim countries, an imposition of culture. And I would argue, well, that has many of the elements that we would consider far right. So why, why is that sort of fundamentalist religion not being referred to in the same way? It does seem to be very selective uh, in terms of how the terms apply. Let's take these two here. Thank you. Um, just first question or point is about hyperbole and the way language and our language for discussing politics has become um, much more hyperbolic. Razi was touching on that. Um, and I'm just wondering if it really is just about not wanting to engage. So if we, if we exaggerate our language and call everyone Nazis, we don't engage. It doesn't quite add up with what's happening on Twitter, which is a lot of engagement. It just is a very high, sort of heightened kind of engagement. So I just wondered if, some, if, if you know, one or two of you could just explain why you think um, like our, our political language has become more hyperbolic recently, if that's a digital thing, or maybe if it hasn't. Um, and then just Jacob on the... Um... It's Jacob. <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> so we have to go panic, that's not, not your name, but it is. Um, yeah, I don't know, I mean, you're used to dangerous, you know, it's so dangerous to evoke that history. Eh, I mean, it's, it's, I would say it's actually more just insulting and, and sort of annoying than dangerous, because actually I think history is there to be invoked and used, and I wonder if you could sort of maybe, if you have any sort of additional thoughts on when it's actually quite good to wade in and say actually there are all these historical parallels, including, you know, it's good to keep the memory of the 1930s alive, I, we don't want to forget it. One of the main reasons why we, we keep it alive is by invoking some erroneous comparisons, but I'm just, I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's so dangerous thing it's necessarily you, and then we'll come back for a quick response and then we'll go back out. Yes. Um, I think it sort of echoes what the gentleman over there said, the idea of um, why is it so difficult now to actually know what fascism is? You know, we're very good at sort of describing fascism as symptoms, but as a German, I'm very well trained in spotting fascists. That's my identity, that's what I do. <laughs> um, so, but, but I've learned that um, the, the Nazis didn't kill uh, the Nazis didn't kill Jews because they were Jews, but they, because they were Nazis. The Nazis were Nazis. Does that make sense? No. Um, but, so, it's not the other way around. So, the symptom is not the cause. And we are, we are sort of always describe fascism by the symptoms of, sort of 1930s fascism. Um, but, as we say, the idea of Islamic terrorism also has got far more elements of fascism in it than right-wing politics in Europe at the moment. I want a quick comment, maybe Paul. Um, you started compiling in 2016, so why then? And as a historian, presumably you're happy that the past is discussed, so what's, what's uncomfortable and problematic about it now for you? Uh, because I think it reveals just how limited uh, the public consciousness of history is. Um, what I mean by that is that it, there's often talked about there's a great deal of interest in history, but actually I'm not sure that there is. And there's a focus on particular periods, and there's an unwillingness to really do what the historian does, which is to cast a cold eye on things and be sceptical and doubtful. And I think the, the point the gentleman made over there um, about us lacking the skills 
uh, that really do make good historians is particularly apparent in one of the subjects he mentioned, which is religion. Uh, the public ignorance of religion now is, is catastrophic in terms of the subject of history. The vast majority of people throughout history have been religious people. They believed it genuinely. The majority of people in our world take a religious view most of the time. We are the exceptions in our irreligion. And to understand the world, both as it is at the moment and as it has been in the past, and as it probably will be in the future, one has to have a deep and sympathetic, that's not necessary, I'm not talking about faith or anything here, but an understanding of religion. That's just one example. Um, because one can't really be a historian until one does. And on the question of Islam, I think obviously uh, we, we barely understand uh, Christianity or the roots of, that, um, of um, creating a liberal society, as people like Tom Holland or Larry Seedentop would argue. Uh, the idea of individualism, which is a kind of Christian inheritance of us. You might even argue that the very study of history is a Christian inheritance. Uh, that's not really understood. Marxism indeed is a kind of secular version of Christianity uh, with its idea of a millenarian end. So without that kind of understanding, without those tools, we're lost. And I, I think that's, that's a fundamental problem with history in this country and throughout the West. Um, Jake, are you guilty of hyperbole? <laughs> no, I think I, I completely agree. And um, it's a point that perhaps is this rhetoric is more insulting than it is dangerous. I think that, in fact, invoking the demons of the Holocaust, of the Nazis, is actually a form of Holocaust denial. So you're basically denying that this thing was so atrocious that you can then compare it to someone like Donald Trump or Tommy Robinson. But I, I, I appreciate the point about when we talk about what, we, what do I mean when I'm saying that this stuff's dangerous, but I'm not saying that if we call people fascists and call people Nazis, that these Nazi zombies are going to rise up and, you know, and be plagued by these people. But instead, I think that when I, when I talk about it being dangerous, I mean that there's disillusionment um, from you know, people who are being called fascists and being called Nazis. That's only ever going to get worse. And what we really need is a proper debate about ideas. And simply having this knee-jerk reaction where we call people Nazis and we call people fascists, it's only going to make that, that gap greater. Vicky, what do you think? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, words matter hugely. Um, I mean, do you remember that one of our own ministers, um, <coughs> Jeremy Hunt, I think it was, referred to the EU as being uh, like the Soviet Union. Perhaps we're talking about economics again, I'm sorry about this. It was a period of increased protectionism. It was a period of increased isolationism. And of course, nationalism. And uh, up to a point, um, what's been going on, uh, certainly in the last 10 years, and when we want to refer to Trump and his own protectionist tendencies, uh, there are some worrying aspects of what's going on right now, which I mean, we may think of. Of that period. Nobody wins in that type of, of fight. In Razi, and then can I see some hands so I can just forget? So, uh, on the point about uh, the focus on education of, of, on the, uh, the Nazis, I think it's not so much how much of it is done, it's, it is, uh, somebody mentioned the symptoms of Nazism. I think the symptoms, uh, it's, it's not clear. I mean, or it is clear, but it's not taught clearly. So, again, I don't see an essential difference between committing genocide in the name of uh, your race and committing genocide in the name of um, society or the proletariat. And uh, so the essential distinction should, should be individualism versus collectivism, and then we should um, explain why, why all forms of collectivism are wrong. And yeah, um, Islam, definitely does that, uh, as it is uh, interpreted by many. Um, but I, I don't want to include them in the, the definition of far right, because I think the whole term should uh, not be used as it's, it's been misused enough that we should be. Yeah. And then Islam will be on the side, uh, or, or you know, more um, consistent applications of it, will be on the side of Nazism and communism. Um, another right. point. I'm going to take right. everybody in the audience, basically, who wants to speak. So let's be quick, but let's get you all in. 
you go first and then you. Keep your hands up and I will endeavour to take you all. Go. Um, why, of all periods in history, do we obsess with the 1930s in particular? Is that down to the fact that, compared to most other periods in history, it's a very <coughs> accepted by almost all in the world that there's a binary good and bad? Does that, is that why this is used as a charade to try and cut off freedom of speech and uh, take your political opponents as the Nazis and therefore it's impossible to pay? Because you pass it along to that man there. Let's go with you. I, I was going to go back to one of the points uh, Raisi made um, about the collectivity and the individuality, because I'm not quite sure if it's as simple as that. So I happen to know a few people who actually support the right wing or supported the right wing of the movement, and all of them were sort of saying to me that they were trying to do this as a way of asserting their own individuality. It was, a, you know, I mean, they were completely confused politically, and you know, but they would say they were going against the mainstream. There was always this element of rebelliousness, which shows how different things can be today to the past. So if you grew up in Eastern Germany, and you remember the old system, and it was an officially anti-fascist state, you'd be an absolute rebel if you wrote on the school, on the board of your, blackboard of your school, uh, we want Hitler to come back. And you'd be severely punished, and you'd be praised, you know, and people would gather around you on the, on the, on the playground, and you'd be praised as a hero afterwards. So I, I don't know if you can, you know, things I think have changed. Can you pass it along to that gentleman there? And then if you, if you can take you. So, I think, that a lot of the problem with the teaching of history is that in general I think most people take history for granted as as it just it just happens. Like there's no attempt to try and explain why things happen in the way that they do. And I think that's really sad actually, because every uh, well thought out philosophy has a theory of history built in. So Marxism has a theory of history, Hegelianism has a theory of history. All of the major philosophical systems have some kind of motor that drives events and progress towards some kind of end or maybe never, just in a cycle. There's a gentleman there, keep your hands up people. Yes, you can. In, in the democracy session earlier this morning, um, Zani Minton Bellows of The Economist said some interesting things. She, she's not still here, is she? No, that's good. I'll make it all up now. <laughs> um, but she really was pushing this uh, parallel between now and the 1930s and 1940s. I can see some people nodding, so I'm not making it up. And it, and it just seemed to me that she was doing this because she realised that there was a real problem with liberal democracy in the 21st century. And she talked about the need to re-energise or rethink liberalism to, for the 21st century. But the truth of the matter was she didn't have many ideas. It, she would have had even fewer ideas that would have connected with the mass of the people. And I think this is what informs so much of the use of history, the misuse of history. It simply becomes a substitute for argument. Rather than talking about now and the real problems that we experience now, it's much easier just to dismiss these people as taking us back to fascism. And, um, Vicky, you are here, so you, you can um, criticise me if I'm being unfair here, but yeah, I think you've just done it to an extent. You said there are parallels between Trump now and 1930s protectionism. Now, I just don't find that helpful. You, you, I know you have objections to what Trump is doing, but please articulate why that is. I don't think you can rely upon the 1930s and say Trump is going in that direction, because society and the world economy now is just so different from how it was then, and politics is also so different. Okay, I'll go with you, and can we bring the mic over to that cluster there? I'm not ignoring everybody in this time of anybody. Right, so when we're talking about the, the left and right, in, in, especially in politics, we mean the economic axis. So really, when you are on the far right, you're supposed to be advocating for 100% uh, freedom or 0% uh, economic uh, slavery. And if you are on the far left, you are really advocating for 100% uh, economic slavery, 0% economic freedom. And if you look at all these parties, none of them, none of them go for uh, a capitalist society where you are economically free. They are all, really, on the left, uh, the socialist or, or communism. 
So that's why I needed to look at the political axis. And when we're really talking about far right, we mean authoritarianism versus libertarianism. And uh, the solution, if you don't like this rise of the far right, is to give more economic freedom. Uh, because if you look, if you look at the, all countries that have economic freedom, well, the more economic freedom they have, the more libertarian they are. So that's your solution. Oh, lady, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not confused, I promise. I feel like there is a, a complete consensus that this use of the far right term and its discourse is incorrect. Would you say, and I think there's also a suggestion that it is a symptom of a kind of flawed teaching of history. And I was just going to say maybe the fact that we all referred it to the 1930s is because it was a particularly dramatic, Eurocentric part, part of history, which is just good to teach and easy to teach to the 15, 16 year olds taking it for GCSE. And also, do you think that there's a flaw in maybe a teacher of history is slightly Marxist or Whiggish right now, and so we're kind of talking about this progression to, if you take the Whiggish view, a liberal democracy, and so we want, we're taking these rises of the far right as awful and just completely in the opposite direction, and is that why we're criticising it so much? I'm going to take you then. If anybody on the panel has anything to say, I want them to say it, but don't have to, do not have to, and we'll go back out. I think there's other signifiers we have to take notice of. They may be small but important. If, if you're black and live on a working class estate, low income, mixed estate like I come from, um, then my neighbour's been stopped 23 times for stop and search by police, and that's one form of crackdown and it's authoritarian. Um, if you work in a bookmark bookshop and you saw people come up, come in and start destroying books and so on, that has very definite echoes. They may be small. If you live in Sweden and you know trucks are put and blown up in front of a left-wing party, you know that has echoes of human history. So the media are kind of um, summing up or simplification of the connections you're making, which I agree are inaccurate. I think there are lots of other things that if you were poor, um, which also points to certain economic conditions that gave rise to political um, situations in the 30s, they, they, there is a palpable fear, and maybe it's not felt by the educated and middle classes. And maybe we need sort of, and you're a great panel, but there needs to be some other people on the panel as well. Does anybody on the panel have anything to say before we take this gentleman there? Quick, quick, quick comments. You're absolutely right, of course. I mean, what I did say at the beginning is that this is very different to how it was in the 1930s because we now have had globalization of finance and also complete uh, um, uh, clarity of what those <coughs> central banks were doing, and they all agreed on doing concerted action in this respect. So it wasn't going to be happening. But then, in answer to an earlier question, to a later question, uh, uh, why do we keep talking about the 1930s? It's because there are some issues coming up which were obvious there. It doesn't mean that we're going to have the same impact because of what I said earlier, actually, it's a completely different environment now. But there are some things that are still around, such as protections and nationalism and so on. And actually, going back to the last question, we have seen that there's quite a lot of, of uh, voting that happens as a result of people feeling disenfranchised. Uh, and, and that's that's a worry. So there are there are... This is, I think, why people are talking about the But I think what I, what I tried to say earlier is that actually those comparisons are not necessarily valid overall, but there are obviously some of the issues that we need to be aware of, such as the distribution of incomes and the quality that's taking place, uh, and so on. Jake? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting point about is this a failure of history? I don't think it is a failure of history. I think most people know about Nazis. I think your average seven year old will tell you that Nazis were bad and give you a rough kind of outline of what they did. I think that what we're seeing it isn't a failure of history, but a failure to engage with genuine ideas. We're seeing a kind of previously people who were politically in control, failing to get to grips, or even willing to get to grips, with issues such as populism, such as immigration. People would rather have a knee-jerk response and call them people fascists and Nazis than engage in a debate. And I think that's the thing that needs to be fixed, not the history curriculum or anything like that. Cool. Um, yeah, just on your point about why people find the 1930s so fascinating, well, and why they return to it again and again. I think it's simply because, as you point out, it's a manic human struggle. But it's also a very, very compelling story. Uh, it's not one that you could make up. But when you read something like, say, Michael Burney's 
uh, the Third Reich um, a new history. It's an extraordinary work that's greatly revealing about human nature, about human foibles, um, and it remains a compelling moment in history, and it always will be, and it will always reveal things. It's been particularly true in this country, uh, where the vast majority of the great historians of the Third Reich have been British and American. It took years for obvious reasons for Germany to catch up and uh, to, to, to work out why. But if you go to the uh, museums that deal with the Third Reich in Berlin and other German ones, you see the vast majority of quotes are from British historians. So we do tend to see it from an Anglo-American viewpoint as well. There's something like the warning from history to use Lawrence Rees's quote. So there's that, and certainly. Rosie? Yeah, on the point about uh, people going to the right uh, as an expression of their individuality. So I, I agree that the left is pushing people uh, to uh, what we call the right, you know, social justice warriors say, you, know, you can't say certain things if you're a white male. That, that'll push people away. Uh, but I don't think blind rebellion is an expression of individuality any more than blind following. I mean, individuality is exercising your own mind uh, your own judgment and not counting how many people are on each side and deciding based on the numbers where, where you want to go. Okay, we're back out. You sir, with the mic. Can I see hands? <clears throat> okay, yes. Yeah. I think it would be a real shame if the only thing that people remembered about the 30s were Hitler, Nazism, uh, concentration camps, and all that kind of stuff, and forget the economic conditions that give rise to the tension, the pressures which capitalism just couldn't resolve. Which led, which led to the, you know, all the things that came after that. The cause of it is much more important than just the symptoms, which are spectacular, and that's what people seem to kind of remember and talk about. The second and final point is, is on this thing about right and so on. I think the main problem is that there is no counter view. The, the left wing has left the field, there's nobody around. So if somebody just says something minor, there's suddenly either far right or far left. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn being labeled as far left is a joke and you know I remember going on demos 30 years ago against racism and the more more National Front people came to one of those demos that maybe a hundred times more than they were there in the States but they got no coverage and nothing on the BBC and no intellectuals talked about it and you've got 20 people in the States and everybody is seeing the rise of fascism I think it's more the decline of left-wing politics that is more staggering than the rise of fascism Okay, pass it to the gentleman in the tie behind you, and whoever's got the mic talk. Hi. Um, whenever I hear a conversation regarding the far right, usually the, the term populism comes on. Um, but is populism not a useful process by which to alleviate um, the potential for slipping toward the far right? It seems that if, uh, if, if populism is, is allowed to, to do what it needs to do, that will release, uh, alleviate some of the stresses that are building up to prevent any brittle failure, which is potentially further down the line if those populist movements are involved. Um, uh, some recent data, for example, is that the, the UK, uh, the growth of the UK, uh, we had 4 million voters for UK at the last election, that was essentially destroyed because the, the populist drive for uh, an EU referendum was, was met. Thank you. Thank you. Pass it to this gentleman there and go. Keep your hands up so I see you. Uh, I think um, we need to change the um, model that we're discussing to the political compass where we have on the left-right axis, socialism versus corporatism, and on the up-down axis, uh, totalitarianism, authoritarianism versus libertarianism. Um, that way we can start to describe different countries around the world. For example, on the left we have a very big difference between Norway or Sweden and uh, communist Russia. And then on the right we have a very big difference between uh, Saudi Arabia and the USA, USA being libertarian. Um, so, one other point about that is that that also allows us to see that those axes really do wrap around themselves. So, um, in the libertarian, authoritarian axis, it's very easy for a strong man in the libertarian uh, uh, state to become a dictator in an authoritarian state. It's much closer to those two extremes than the centre. And the same for the uh, left and right, the socialism versus the uh, 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 corporatism, uh, kind of in a sense, or you know, maybe maybe in a sense is uh, the Nazi Party uh, being the S in the socialist, you know, the Nazi Party with socialism, 
and that very quickly sw switched over to the far right of the uh, Nazi party about you know uh, the Aryan race and us being better than everybody else, uh, the individual versus the collective. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay, so gentlemen, here. <coughs> um, I think I think you've already <coughs> lost the political argument if you start arguing by analogy, historical analogy in particular, because. Um, I think people have made the point, I don't want to repeat it, that you know, the conditions are so entirely different. There might be some similarities. The only similarities is that the people, we're alive, we drink, we eat and drink, we you know, propagate, um, we live in countries, and etc. That's about the only similarity. If you look at the societies at the time, they were so fundamentally different. You know, I, won't, I don't have time to go into this, but I mean, the fundamental point is that there were classes. It was a class struggle. It was a struggle, a life and death struggle, which in fact the, the German capitalist class being so weak actually allowed Hitler to come to power as a blunt weapon to smash the working class. That's what it was really all about. Where do we see that today? You know, where do we see organised working class opposition to anything? The right today are like a, a pale imitation, they're like a caricature of what the right was in, in fascist Germany. They're like pussycats. And our social justice warriors, about the most radical thing they do, is sit in their underpants and tweet. They've never been on a demonstration, they've never been on a barricade, they've never been in a fight, they've never experienced anything like that. The idea that this is somehow similar, um, I'm sorry, it's even an insult to fascists, never mind the left. So I think, I, think I, I really do think that Jacob's right, that the, the really important point here is why are we having this discussion rather than trying to understand what's behind what's really going on here? You know, how, how do we explain Trump? Trump, a fascist, Adolf Hitler? I mean, he's not anywhere near Adolf Hitler. You know, in, in any sense, it doesn't even like they both had bad hairstyles, but it's about the only similarity. He's coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pass it to this person here. Who's got the mic over there? You do. Go. Yeah, I think that I really agree with that. I think it's notable as the panel's established that this kind of formula that economic problems, depression, 1930s fascism, that's kind of how it works. There's a lot of liberal commentators and Latin commentators basically saying that. And the point's been made, they, they write politics out, class politics being the case. But I think it's another important point uh, here as well. That, that assumption that people will react to economic problems won't well. It assumes a priori that individuals react to economic circumstances by turning on other people and it kind of abstracts from all the political debates that are being had and actually that could be had. And actually that intensification of writing the individual out of history here is the very reason that we have populism actually. And I think this tendency to sort of, you know, anybody who walks on a march within 100 miles of Tommy Robinson is going to be labelled as a, a fascist or far right, anybody who identifies or says anything about, about that. That actually just reinforces and, and, and almost further justifies populism as a desire to have some control over your own life and, and to be part of the society. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm really interested in the. I agree with everyone that I don't think terms really help anyone. But what is absolutely clear has been the absolute collapse of the centre in politics across the West. Social Democrats are nowhere. And if you look at voting trends as to why that is, uh, and with respect, you didn't mention this, but you said it's economics. Actually, what people tell us is two things. It's immigration and it's fear of terrorism. And I think the fear amongst a number of people may well be that the solutions to those two key problems could be a ramping up of the powers of the state. And that might be something where people are saying, well, actually, there are parallels that we can draw. That is the fear of the, the power of the state to deal with those two problems, which... Poll after poll is saying people are very worried about. Thank you. Can we go to that gentleman there and use that? Um, so, um, so I do, I think uh, one of Paul's opening remarks were, were um, uh, really apposite. He's talking about the fact that we all think we know something about this period. Um, and I think that is really important because the formula um, that you were just describing there about the economy uh, and then um, uh, nationalism and of course, you could throw into, I agree with that, and you could throw into that the idea of a strong leader, charismatic. Uh, we all think we know exactly how fascism emerged, and the working class blindly follow, 
Um, but then the reality is, as uh, Norman was saying over there, is that actually, uh, so in election, people always talk about the, the fact that Hitler was voted in, but he wasn't. He didn't win a majority. He was handed power um, by the Kaiser. Yeah. So um, I guess the, the why now, I, I, I just want to throw in something that, um, there was a book we read for the Academy a couple of years ago, Del Sol, on Icarus Fall, and she makes the point that we've never actually really explained fascism. So she kind of flips it on its head, and it's not really why now. It's almost, it will always be. This will always be the argument that people, people bring out um, when you talk about democracy, when you talk about the deadness, when you talk about people's strong leaders. It will always come back to fascism. And the point she makes is until we do deal with it, then it's, it's always going to be the case. I do I mean right about it, probably. <laughs> So, uh, I think this has been covered, but um, I'm very sympathetic to the uh, idea that the, the term doesn't do a good enough job of delineating the, the categories of people within you know, all right or, or right or left, really, at all. Um, for instance, I think this was mentioned at the very beginning, um, for instance, religion, radical Islam, you could say that um, there are, holds very illiberal values, yet tolerating all religions on the left, at least in the U.S., is, is a very liberal thing to do. So um, there's a dichotomy there. In the same way, um, the one major effect of Trump, for instance, is, is his effect on um, free press and free speech. And really just that he, uh, one of the lasting effects, I mean, I, I agree that comparing him to Hitler is completely unfair, but um, a, a lasting effect that he has had is um, this, people are throwing the word out post-truth. He just lies through his teeth. He just lies and lies and lies and lies and lies. And even his lies are different now. I mean, politicians have lied forever. But the way that Trump lies, it just, it doesn't even matter that he's telling, if he tells the truth. And his, because he's speaking directly to a certain base that is a minority in the States that doesn't care that he's lying. And, um, and so it's just kind of taken for granted, and, and that is, it's no longer a problem. Um, and so, how should we think about institutions like that? I mean, so the institution of free religion, the, the institution of, of free press, these, these pillars of society, how should we think about them going forward? And what things should maintain themselves in a society over time? Okay, we've got somebody there, and there's time for one more, if there's anybody else, before I take in the panel. Or, you know, not sure? Okay. Yes, you're the last person from the floor, and then I'll take the panel for that. So, one of the things that's brought up a lot is uh, political alarmism about, you know, uh, having the person who's opposing you being the worst thing in the world that could possibly ever get into power. I was wondering whether or not that is a uh, sort of a sign that government is some, in some way set up wrong, that there is no, you know, in the UK there is no constitution to protect people with individual rights, and people see government as a life or death situation where we must get power now, otherwise the other side is going to in some way affect our lives so we can no longer pursue our lives in the way that we wish to. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like the panel to sum up, they can't say everything, but maybe um, I just made three points, I think, or three subjects in response. It would be great to respond to you all, but I think we'd be here all night and probably until tomorrow morning as well if I did that. Uh, the point that was made by the gentleman over there about Sandy Newton Bedden, um, I don't know whether any of you saw the uh, conversation that she had with the economist with Steve Bannon. Um, but Bannon was actually, within his own terms, very impressive. And she wasn't. He ran rings around her. Because although he doesn't have the solutions, in my opinion, Steve Bannon, far from it, he knew what the problem was. Whereas any of the is in the whole economist world, just read Jeremy Cliff and The Economist, or that kind of self-satisfied world that they inhabit. And they simply don't even know the problem. And I think that is a major problem. We may, I think, as a consequence of that, also see the return of the nation state as a real safeguard of what people imagine is the safeguard in a, in a fragile, uh, globalised world. But I'll leave that for something else. Someone mentioned the issue of humiliation. 
If we want to understand how Nazi Germany came about, one of the important things is about humiliation, I think. And it's interesting, next year we'll commemorate the anniversary of the Versailles Peace Treaty, uh, which was an awful affair, which left Germany utterly humiliated and so to say to what was to come. It was almost, almost a Carthaginian peace. And contrast that with what happened at the uh, Congress of Vienna in 1814, uh, where, in part because of the brilliance of Taliban, a generous settlement was offered to France and the rest of Europe post post war, and it guaranteed peace in Europe for pretty much a hundred years, with one or two mild uh, skirmishes. Um, and humiliation is something that I think is crucial to this at the moment. The one thing that does worry me in my darker hours is I think something that the man at the back mentioned about uh, people who have been forgotten, marginalised. And I think we saw this throughout the Brexit affair, when people were humiliated. And I saw for the first time in my life, so this is the first time in half a century, and certainly probably long before that, where the very idea of democracy was questioned in the West. People actually put forward the idea that there were people who were not intelligent enough, not knowledgeable enough to vote. And that was particularly ironic, seeing as we were celebrating and commemorating this year the 100th anniversary of women getting the vote. That argument was once made against women. It was once made against working class men as well. And we thought those battles had been won, but I'm not sure that they have any. And that Zoe Minton Beddoe's worldview and this are very, very strongly aligned. And I think that is where one might find a sort of settlement in that humiliation, um, particularly, I think, in this country, in England, it worries me a great deal if we do see the break of Britain. Remember that this is a country where it has eight out of ten of the poorest regions in Europe, uh, which is a quite shocking. So there is a huge division in this country. One only has to drive through the place where I come from, the West Midlands, the North West, and the North of Germany. Look at the coastal towns of this country. And until we settle that, there will always be a danger of a return to authoritarianism or whatever one wishes to call it. Thank you. Well, I um, so I agree with the gentleman who said white supremacists get too much uh, coverage. And I think you know, even, in, even in the big uh, march in Charlottesville last year, there were only a few hundred people. Uh, they're getting coverage because of not because they're you know there's a danger that they're going to take over soon, but just because of the, the nastiness of what what it is that they they shout, um, and that's unfortunate. But I disagree that the left has disappeared. I think if we're talking about economics, at least in this country, the right has disappeared. And uh, I mean, we have a conservative government uh, that is on economics to the left of the uh, labor government from the previous decade, and this is 30 years after Thatcher basically saved this country. So uh, I think I think the left hasn't disappeared. We're, we're, you know, it, it, there's a chance that a Marxist is going to be our next <coughs> prime minister. So the left, unfortunately, is alive and well. Uh, and uh, on the point of why we obsess uh, with uh, the Nazis, I think or with the 30s, um, I think it's important to focus on how horrible that was. But why we're focused on them and, and not communists? I think because they're classified as right wing. So you know, right wing genocide is worse than left wing genocide, uh, apparently. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think about humiliation. Uh, I, I did say actually it wasn't just the the, the national humiliation. It was was what was done economically to Germany. Uh, it suffered quite significantly after the, it was punished uh, following the, the losing the First World War, and that didn't help at all. Uh, what happened with Keynes, of course, uh, our own uh, very good economist, was that he intervened, worked very hard to ensure it didn't happen the second time around, and of course we had martial aid and everything else, and, and Germany was given quite a lot of cash. Uh, and was allowed that to grow and grew very, very significantly after that. Economically, it could be well became the is now the leader in, in, in Europe. Uh, but I think the, the institutions, 
sorry, do you disagree that Germany did well after the war? No, we're not. We're very much disagreeing with Claire. With Claire. We're with revisionism. Oh, fine. Okay. okay. Just, a, just a victim, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All, All right, right. fine. That's a different issue. issue. Listen, it's, 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 it's not. Okay. okay. What's happening? She's <laughs> right. I'm sorry. It's my it's fault, right. fault right. to ask it for clarification. Uh, the institution's point is absolutely right uh, uh, in the end. What you need to do to avoid fascism, if you like, or, or, or whichever or whichever side, and certainly to avoid uh, the, the post-truth uh, culture that we have at present, is to have the right institutions that control it. If the moment these institutions are in danger, then that's a real, real issue, uh, as we're seeing sort of partly in, in the US, but also uh, in a number of cases in Europe, unfortunately, whether it's Hungary or Poland, where uh, the European Commission is now looking at it very, very carefully as to whether they're meeting the requirements or even being uh, in the EU. And I understand entirely uh, that we absolutely need to understand fascism and how it got there. Uh, and uh, and also, uh, you know, some of us, I don't know about the Greeks here, have experienced actually having right-wing fascism. So I lived under a dictatorship uh, for a number of years, which simply wasn't very pretty, and I don't want to see that ever again. Jacob. Yeah, I'm afraid of differs slightly from Razia, because I really do think that, uh, as the person here was suggesting, that what we're seeing now with people calling people fascists and Nazis and trying to invoke the image of the, of the past is really symptomatic of the decline of left-wing politics back in the past. The idea of being left-wing was one of solidarity, is one of identifying with the mass and with the people. Um, these days what we're seeing is an elitist, self-appointed left, supposedly, um, who are doing their best to try and distance themselves from these people. I mean, how bizarre is it that the so self-proclaimed left are relying on the institutions of the CIA and the FBI to try and topple Trump? These institutions were persecuted for the left for bloody ages. These are like the least left-wing institutions in America. Just look at the instance of Bannon, um, how you know, the people talking about fascism and Nazism have tried to no-platform Steve Bannon um, from speaking at a number of con con conferences. I mean, I'm no fan of Bannon, but I mean, surely the idea that you would no-platform, there's nothing, I mean, that's exactly what the fascist Nazis were doing. They were no platforming people, they are denying people platforms for what they believed in. Um, this is why we're really seeing the decline of, of why it's symptomatic of left in politics. And the point about populism, about what we should be kind of doing here. But I think, you know, um, I for one think that it is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, if I had to choose between going for a pint with the people who are being called fascists, being called Nazis, the Trump voters, the Brexit voters, the slightly disillusioned voters, or having a pint with the self-appointed pompous people who like to wax lyrical about fascism. Um, I'm afraid it's kind of a dumb deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was um, an excellent discussion. Please join me in thanking our panel.